Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Alyssa Karpinka, and I'm the event coordinator for McNally Robinson Booksellers in Saskatoon. This event is coming to you from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis Nations. Just to note that this event is being live streamed to our YouTube page, so please be aware of the webcam behind you. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the launch of Apostles of Inequality, Rural Poverty, Political Economy, and the Economist, 1760 to 1860, and Tiny Engines of Engines of Abundance, a history of peasant productivity and oppression. Thank you to Jim for being with us tonight, and to our guest host, Dr. Valerie Karenek. I'd also like to thank University of Toronto Press and Fernwood Publishing for working with us to create this event. Dr. Valerie Karenik is the A.S. Morton Chair in History and Research Director in the Department of History at the University of Saskatchewan. We'll now hear from her. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. It's really nice to see those of you who are able to come out. I know March is a busy time of year. We have some people joining us. How is the volume? Is it good? Excellent. We have some people joining us uh, online as well, and uh, so I'm glad everyone could be here. It's a pleasure to be here introducing Jim, uh, who I've worked with my entire time that I've been here at the University of Saskatchewan, and, and really an honor to help him launch uh, these two volumes, Fossils of Inequality, Rural Poverty, Political Economy, and the Economist, 1760 to 1860. Published by UT Press and Tiny Engines of Abundance, a history of peasant productivity and repression, which was published by Fernwood Press. Now, to many of those who are here with us uh, or listening virtually, Dr. Hand requires no introduction. He's been a historian at the University of Saskatchewan for 37 years. Many will know him as an award winning teacher and innovator in the study of broad forces, having co created with Chris Inwood at the University of Guelph, the Guatemala study. Uh, a broad term in 1997. The Guatemala study abroad term ran until the mid 2010s, which is a huge long time in terms of study abroad programming. Evidence both of its intrinsic educational value, but also the dedication of those involved in teaching and supervising the students on those terms. Not only Dr. Handy at the U of S, but also Dr. Callie Dianandid in the Department of Political Studies. Dr. Handy's commitment to that program was recognized by the George Ivany Internationalization Award from the U of S. Now, outside the classroom, Dr. Handy's expertise as a scholar, a historian, and author is widely recognized, and so that might not be known to everybody who's with us this evening. In 2010, the Canadian Association for Latin American and Caribbean Studies honored him as a distinguished fellow. Tonight, everyone's going to realize why that is, as his research insights and contributions are very significant. Now, as one of his colleagues, I know over the course of approximately the last decade, perhaps a little longer, Jim's been working on a book. Most of us are. It's how we, you know, kind of break the ice with each other in the elevator. Yeah, how's that book going? <laughs> yeah, book, book, book. And we've been tantalized with chapters and a few peer-reviewed articles in that time period. But then last year, two volumes. And stakes were raised, not one book, two. My first thought was, well, I guess COVID was good for something and for someone. These works are peas in a similar pod. They're equal parts scholarly and political. And both are engaged with work that has fascinated Dr. Gandhi throughout his career. The history of peasants, peasant agriculture, and the persistent antipathy with which peasant farmers are edged out, pushed aside, castigated, for their less productive, less profitable, and above all, less capitalistic ways of working and living. In Apostles of Inequality, Dr. Handy turns his lens to the English countryside during the 18th and 19th century, where small producers and farmers were constantly besieged with plans for improvement throughout the pages of The Economist, and via the various political economists who edited the journal, their theories, all of it backed, of course, by governmental support. Improvement had a very steep price, dispossession, poverty, and migration. One reviewer has commented, Apostles of Inequality is another magnificent book by Jim Handy. Handy's narration is not merely of historical interest, it indirectly sheds light on much of what's happening in rural areas around the world today. Through land grabbing, famine, extreme exploitation and oppression, 
and the responses of migration and word resistance. Now, historians write history because as humanities and social science scholars, we're engaged in important, timely questions. And here one can clearly see the hallmarks of good history. As Dr. Handy's scholarship analyzes and historicizes a major contemporary preoccupation, sustainability, and in particular, sustainable agriculture. What's the history of those concepts? Why, when, and for what rationale did big scale agriculture emerge and become predominant? Tiny Engines of Abundance is, as part of the critical development series at Fernwood, even more focused on those questions. Here, readers get marvelous insight into the skill, abilities, and productivity of peasant agriculture in England, Jamaica, Guatemala, Nigeria, and Kerala, India, from the 18th through the late 20th century. 200 years of histories that illustrate vividly the importance of small scale farmers and producers, as well as the persistent repression and challenges they have faced. Tiny Engines of Abundance rebukes the pride of place given to industrial agriculture, both here and abroad. This is engaging, well written, accessible history, one that marshals the primary evidence, shares insight into these gripping political and social histories, and asks important questions that resonate not only in past eras, but equally and is now as we grapple with climate change, sustainable agriculture, poverty and famine. So tonight we have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Jim Gandhi and then in our question and answer, which follows, the chance to ask him questions about his work. Those joining us online, please make sure to write your questions in the chat line. It's moderated and those will be read out at the end during the Q&A as well. So please join me in welcoming my colleague, Dr. Jim Gandhi. Thank you, Valerie. I often think that uh, Valerie does a better job of discussing our works than I would, and we all do, uh, to make sure that this is done. Um, thank you all for coming, and thank you, McNally Robinson and Alisa, for organizing this. Uh, Lisa makes them look seamless, but I suspect there's an awful lot of work that goes into it. She looks so seamless. Um, I don't do this very often. And the last time I did a book launch was in about North City, and there were 500 people at it. And uh, because I was a sort of about this crowd, every now and then somebody would shout out a revolutionary slogan uh, in the middle of the talk. So a different crowd, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how yeah. Robert Robinson thinks about revolutionary slogans. But if the spirit moves you, perhaps cave even those campesinos. Uh, uh, longer peasants might be a worthwhile <laughs> slogan to think about as you move forward. So lots of people are involved in putting a book together. I often think that uh, book launches should be like those uh, Academy Awards ceremonies where the whole cast and crew get to come up on stage and we all crowd around the podium and struggle to get five minutes in the word. Book launches aren't like that. The author sort of stands alone up here, um, but imagine this crowd behind me as we move forward. I'm not going to do the Academy Award thing and thank everyone who deserves thanks uh, while I wait for the music. Um, uh, beginning with my grade home, my grade eight homeroom teacher, Mrs. Freilich. Um, but there are three people I would like especially to acknowledge. Two are, in the, are here tonight Carla Fur allowed me to convince her that reading very old copies of the Economist newspaper on microfiche was an exciting way to spend the summer. <laughs> and then went on to do a lovely MA thesis on the paper, keeping my interest in it alive. And Patrick Chasse did valuable research for the Guatemalan and Kerala chapters in Tiny Engines of Abundance. And a quick read through the footnotes of the Guatemalan chapter will show you how thoroughly I plundered his wonderful PhD dissertation for that chapter. Not here tonight, but perhaps checking in remotely. I would also like to thank my partner, Annette Emery, who read every word of both of these books, sometimes multiple times, and often helped me choose the right one. Hi, Annette. <laughs> The marvelous historian, Haitian historian, Michel Roth Trouillot, has written often about the silences of the past. He suggests that these silences, those things not remembered, not 
supported and counted them, threatened to overwhelm our sense of history. He suggests further that what is remembered, recorded, and recounted is seldom accidental, seldom innocent. It is the historian's task, he argues, to do continual battle against those silences, to provide an opportunity for those voices, the voices of the silence, to be heard. In a very small way, these two books take up Trio's challenge and try to allow some silenced voices to be heard. Both books, as Valerie mentioned, detail the remarkable productivity of very small scale peasant producers and outline the myriad ways historically that productivity has been ignored, discounted, and attacked. The multiple ways peasant livelihoods have been portrayed as wretched by those who have no knowledge of their lives. The first book, this book, in the order in which they were written, tries to explain what I see as a contradiction. It's going to fall off. I can do it this way. As a contradiction in the way English agricultural history has been written. England is supposed to have enjoyed an agricultural revolution that dramatically increased English agricultural production and set the stage for apparently for the Industrial Revolution and England's growing prosperity in the 19th century. The exact age and nature of that agricultural revolution are often debated, but it is usually placed solidly in the century between 1750 and 1850. But in exactly this time period, the majority of the rural population of England suffered through increasing poverty and dislocation. Real rural wages, that's hard to say, real rural wages fell 50%. Rural poverty increased markedly. Housing was poorer and harder to find. Malnutrition increased. And increasing numbers of people were reliant on welfare, many thrown into large institutional poor houses designed purposefully to be awful places for those forced into. The few attempts to explain this apparent contradiction have focused on the enclosure of common lands as the key to increased poverty. As important as this was, neither the timing nor the location of such enclosures fit very well with increased, with such increased poverty. So we need to look elsewhere for an explanation. Apostles suggests that much of that poverty was the result of a long attack on cottagers and cottage gardens. Cottage gardens have been ignored in most of the histories, primarily because they were so tiny, often little more than a rood of land in a quarter of an acre. Small specks in the landscape of huge estates and large commercial farms. But hundreds of reports, comments, memoirs, poems, and complaints from landowners make it abundantly clear not only how important these small cottage gardens were, but how remarkably productive they were as well. Given how obvious this evidence is from anyone who looked for it, one of the perplexing silences for me was why they were ignored or belittled at the time and have attracted so little attention since. In attempting to answer that question, I discussed the growing fascination of what its practitioners insisted was the new science of political economy and its obsession with capital as the source of all that was wonderful in this new world. The deity of their idolatry, which they have set up to worship in the high places of the Lord, according to one of the rare books. So Apostles dissects the writings of Adam Smith, the Reverend Thomas Robert Malthus, David Ricardo, Nassau Sr., and other political economists, and their role in favoring capital over people in the countryside. 
third section of the book deals with the most important popularizer of political economy from the middle of the 19th century, the Economist newspaper. Begun in 1843, dedicated to proselytizing what its editor described as the pure principles of political economy and an ardent champion of measures to clear the way for capital in the countryside, both in England and elsewhere, and in the process clearing the land of business. As the paper said, a pursuit for which the capitalists cannot pay wages should be instantly abandoned. You'll get lots of money from this as well. So the major purpose of a book launch is to sell books. Um, I recognize this is a tougher proposition for apostles than for tiny, given that it's three and a half times the price. So in an, in an attempt to tease open your wallets, uh, or at least to get you to check it out of your library, I thought I might read four very short snippets from different sections of the first is an account of the productivity of these small carded college garden, cottage gardens. Boy, this is small fruit. <laughs> In 1798, Sir Thomas Bernard sent a note that was published in Annals of Agriculture. Bernard described a cottage and a garden near Tadcaster. They often admired when passing on the road. One day, Bernard stopped to inquire about the land and its occupant. It was farmed by 67-year-old Brenton Abbott and his wife, who was unnamed. Abbott had a rude quarter acre of land, and I quote, enclosed by a cut quick hedge and containing the cottage, 15 apple trees, one green gauge tree, three wine cellar plum trees, two apricot trees, several gooseberry and currant bushes, abundance of common vegetables, and three hives of bees. And the a quarter acre of land. Abbott got about 40 bushels of potatoes from his land and worked a little for Squire Fairfax holding turnips. Abbott and his wife, 45 years and seven children, lived very happily together on the land, according to Bernard. Anyway. Let me give you another description of these small colleges. In 1806, Sir William Putney, one of the wealthiest members of the Board of Agriculture, and one of the wealthiest men in England, sent a most interesting note. He described the garden of one of the cottagers on his estate. The couple were unnamed in his report, but the husband was a collier, and the wife did most of the work in the garden. It had started out as very poor soil, which, the, which she had improved immensely over the years through constant care. She paid three shillings rent for the land and had it for three lives. They had been there for 38 years. They had six living children. She planted land in corn, potatoes, and garden stuff, as Bernard, as Pope said. She raised a pig, purchased young in February, fattened from kitchen scraps and garden waste, and sold in January. She kept no land fallow, got better yields than the larger farmers around her. Putney attributed her success to routine home through constant care. Weeds were dispatched instantly. She had developed a routine for seeding the wheat along with digging up the potatoes, and she manured whenever she could, even collecting manure from the road for the garden. There are many other such glowing accounts in the book and hundreds of others that didn't find their way into the book. Of course, rural folk didn't simply accept these changes and the deteriorating conditions. Rural England, especially in the South, was torn by pretty constant unrest. Indeed, so frequent was such unrest that some have described the period from 1790 to 1850 as 
a rural moor. Workers rioted over wages, food costs, restrictions on relief, and access to land. By the 1820s, the most common form of protest was to write wheat wheat ricks or haystacks on fire, and occasionally fire machinery and buildings as well. The form of protest abetted by the recent spread of a new invention, the match. There was nothing funny about these protests or about the official reaction. Hundreds of people were hung, thousands in prison, and thousands more banished to Australia, which was considered to be a more terrible punishment. Nonetheless, one of my favorite accounts Sorry, one of his favorite accounts of this protest has a bit of humor. When haystacks were set on fire at a farm in Ramston, Cambridgeshire in October 1844, the fire quickly spread to farm buildings. Fire engines got there promptly, but according to one expert, and I quote, they were entirely useless sorry, one report, and I quote, they were entirely useless as there were not hands sufficient to work them. The laborers of the village refused to assist. I continue to quote, some of the Rampton people during the progress of the fires amused themselves with roasting apples, which had been stolen from the neighboring orchard, whilst others were eating fowls, which they roasted with the feathers on it. I love that story. It's just, you can just see these guys doing this. A sympathetic Times correspondent, Campbell Foster, filed a series of stories on the fires in 1844. He argued persuasively for the value of garden ground and a snug cottage. He reported that a clear pattern existed where agricultural laborers were well paid and had the use of cottage allotments. They were, there were no fires. Even in those districts with low wages and half employment, cottage allotments were, in his words, little oases in their deserts. There grew the rent. But in the districts where fires predominate, the workers had irregular employment and bad wages and few allotments. Foster said, the farmer looks at them as he does his horses, his animals, out of whom he must get as much work at as little cost as possible. Or as one threatening letter sent to farmers near Stowmarket asked, gentlemen, I've thought it proper of writing these few words just to show you and let you know how poor are oppressed in this place. I ask what you must expect, but fire. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to leave this reading without seeing one once from the Economist newspaper. The paper did its very best, continued constantly to make the case for the benefits of large capital intense farms and to argue against small holdings or cottage, cottage gardens. But the paper didn't restrict its sites to England. It was particularly influential about Ireland during the Irish potato famine from 1845 to 1850-51, when over a million people died of famine or related disease. Partly because Lord, the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, Lord Clarendon, was a personal friend of the editor of the paper, James Wilson, and they kept up an active correspondence during this years. I will provide just one reading to suggest how the paper approached Ireland during this time, but I would love to read you my Oops, sorry. In December 1847, paper first trotted out a horse that would ride for some time. The Irish could be reformed when surrounded by their betters, but they were irredeemable at home. I quote. Reckless of consequences and apparently without the slightest interest in social order. 
A remarkable article in 1848 began with, thank God we are Saxon. And then went on to compare the solid, slow, reflective, phlegmatic temperament, that's a quote, of the Englishman, compared to the savage Celt and the flighty Gaul. For the paper, the Frenchman is a civilized Celt. The Irishman is a barbaric Gaul. It went on. Even in 1850, as the famine neared the end, the economist continued to use arguments about race to rationalize the failure of its political economy prescriptions for Ireland. And this is a very long quote. Whenever the Irish peasantry are so situated, either by subordination of their, of their position or by minority in numbers, as to take the tone from those above them and those around them, they succeed in advance. Whenever they are so dominant, either in numbers of influ or influence, as to overpower such foreign elements of amendment as may have settled among them, or where they are without a strong, large, and prominent admixture of such foreign superiorities, the failings of the race prevail and they seem rapid in social condition. At home, the Irishman is alone, dominant and uncorrected. He is among Irishmen with the same constitutional failings as himself, from, from whom he can derive only encouragement for all of those qualities which need enlightenment, shame, and correction. Perhaps worst of all, according to the paper, they still sigh for the pity. My Irish Catholic mother should have been allowed to read them. Perhaps I might indulge one more reading from the discussion of the economist. As the last quote suggested, the paper increasingly echoed the virulent racism in its writings about economics and the proper ordering of societies. This was most apparent as the paper began to look farther afield for locations it might use to replace cotton from the American South in the context of the US Civil War and turned its sites. Africa. In 1861, the economist wrote, the one necessary essential to the development of these new sources of prosperity is the arrangement of some industrial system under which very large bodies of dark laborers will work willingly under a very few European supervisors. It is not only individual labor which is required, but organized labor, labor so scientifically arranged that the maximum result shall be obtained at a minimum of cost. A new organization, therefore, must be commenced. It is clear that the dark races must in some way or other be induced to engage white men women. The, I take my economist. Um, here, the economist loves to tout its history, publishes a magazine called 1843, a glossy magazine. If I had the economist's history, I would not be so quick to draw attention to. Tiny engines of abundance, the history of peasant productivity and repression follows, as Ms. Gallery suggested, naturally from Apostles. Indeed, I started sketching it out before Apostles was finished. It extends that history, details both the remarkable productivity of peasant agriculture and the multiple various peasants that have attacked in five places, England. 1750 to 1850, Jamaica around the period of emancipation from slavery in 1844, Guatemala and Nigeria in the 20th century, and Kerala, India, following the land between the land and that in 1969. I really enjoyed writing this book. Each chapter 
allowed me vicariously to visit with different people and enjoy briefly their lives. So each was very different there. And the nature of the attacks were very different. They were also similar in important ways. As historian Stephen Stoll has argued in the context of Appalachia, no two dispossessions are the same, but they lie. And each he requires, each he argues, required a story to justify that. Triot would counter, I expect, that each of such, that each justification required a silence. I thought long and hard about what to read to you tonight. Given how much I liked each of these chapters, it seemed choosing to read that one example was a bit by Gaston Trent chasing the third child. We might have it, but they never admit it. Andrew suggested I let someone show out the page number from the audience and just begin reading it at that point. <laughs> Though that has its attractions. Instead, I thought I might read a bit from the introduction and the conclusion. On point beforehand, Arthur Stritchcomb once wrote, argument without detail and evidence is just a read. You will need to trust me that the chapters provide such detail and evidence, or better yet, read the book and decide for yourself. Taken together, these accounts provide over 200 years of descriptions of the marvelous productivity of small-scale peasant agriculture. Sometimes sympathetic, often astonished observers noted that what should have noted what should have been obvious to anyone seriously considering the nature of agricultural production. The return from any piece of land is directly proportional to the amount of labor and care that goes into it. Almost all of these observers described an agriculture that was startling in its diversity, yet remarkably similar in many respects. Around the world, throughout history, those with control over tiny plots of land converted them into gardens. Crops not only used up all available space on the ground, but grew to different heights, with roots that tapped the soil at varying depths. Different plants replenished the soil, fire refixing nitrogen. Every time I look up, I use my spot, or providing an abundance of organic litter. Others provided shade, protected more fragile crops from wind, or had roots that were especially important in binding the soil and preventing erosion. Some plants did better in particularly damp soils. Others flourished in dry, sandy, or rich soils. Some produced early, providing nutrition before the full fall harvest came. Others bore fruit late, extending the harvest and allowing labor demand to be spread out. Getting the right mix required years of experience, hard work, and constant care. As one Guatemalan reformer proclaimed, the land had to be worked with a combination of the whole and love. I got that. Okay. The right mix also required careful experimentation. These accounts describe a remarkable array of new crops, oral from far flung parts of the world. There was peasant producers who ensured that a broad range of new world crops, from potatoes to tomatoes to corn, became staples of small scale production from Europe to China and in between. The lives depicted here might be surprising to some. We have been programmed through 200 years of writing about improvement, progress, agricultural modernization, and development. 200 years of proclaiming the moral imperative of improved industrial agriculture to feed the world, to conflate the peasant with poverty. We have been programmed to regard a peasant position, existence is synonymous with almost idiotic metrics, as one description of Irish cobbler suggested. More often, though, descriptions of peasant livelihoods speak of determined self reliance, carefully limited needs, 
Sorry, once we spot again. Carefully limited needs, simple comforts, and hard won independence. What often emerges in these descriptions of present livelihoods is not wretchedness, but abundance. If I can just go to the conclusion, and then I'm done. This book was meant to be a discussion of the history of peasant productivity and the various persecutions, ambushes in the, name, in the words of John Berger, they have endured. It portrays, I hope convincingly, the extraordinary efficiency with which peasants, English cottagers, Jamaican ex-slaves, Guatemalan Mayan campesinos, Nigerian hill farmers, and Corolla hut dwellers have drawn often bountiful harvests from small bits of land, sufficient to feed themselves and their families and to mark the surplus. It draws these descriptions very often from commentators who were initially unsympathetic to such livelihoods. Time after time, observers were amazed, sometimes delighted, sometimes dismayed at the way intensive labor on intercropped plots of land, carefully worked in ways both informed by experience and open to prudent experimentation could produce such bounty year after year, generation after generation. The book also attempts to portray the various ways these livelihoods have been obstructed and attacked, and the arguments used to justify those attacks. It shows that though the protagonists have changed, the arguments remain remarkably consistent. Peasants were ambushed because they were reluctant to provide labor to cows, because they were thought prone to having too many children, because they threatened the environment, and because their limited needs meant they could never contribute decisively to economies built on incessant expansion and accumulation. While well, a work of history, this book is not primarily directed at the past, but perhaps like John Berger's Peasants, it was located in the past, but maintains a vision of the future, as do all explanations of the past. As Lewis Namier said many decades ago, historians remember the future and imagine the past. The future this book remembers is one in which we've learned enough from the past to lose the false confidence that we can know the dreams of others. Thank you very much. Oh, it's on. It's on? Okay, perfect. Thanks, Jim. That was fantastic. Um, given the subject matter and, and your passion to give us a wonderful commercial about why you should buy those two books, um, I think uh, most of us would be racing to see if you can stay on the office before they sell it. There's not, there's not a big pile there, so game on this and do start this with me. Um, but I wanted to open the floor now to uh, people in the room and people virtually to ask some questions of our speaker. I've got a few in the back of my mind. If it was a bit tongue tied, you should be which is what happens. Oh, you've got a question, Alex. Go right ahead. So I really admire your commentary on women's labor in terms of like a more subtle, almost subaltern place. Um, I'm not sure if this is within the scope of your research, but when the settlers come to Canada and create this myth of the uh, lazy indigenous man um, in matriarchal societies and how women were always working the land and whatnot, what would your would your response then be that um, the settlers almost forget? their history or how would you like to that the settlers forget the history of the Aboriginal people and the Indigenous people or their own history? Oh, their own history of women's labor. Um, I'm not sure if it's forgetting their own history or, or forgetting the history of Indigenous people in the Americas. I suspect it's more about 
I'm not being interested enough to understand and to require. Um, I don't know an awful lot about uh, and within indigenous agriculture in Canada before um, contact. I know a fair bit, I think I know a fair bit about Latin America and you know, indigenous uh, agriculture before contact. And there was nobody that was busy. Um, about you know, the group of people raising um, in indigenous agriculture and in America, this was amazingly diverse and amazingly seductive. Just one of the probably get these numbers wrong. Some of the yeah, I'll use the numbers in a minute. They might be wrong. Now, check with you later and we'll see if they're right. Some of the people of our, some of the historians and others and geographers, geographers and others who have worked on this have suggested that in the period between 1492 and early 1600s, when 90 to 95% of the population of the Americas died from disease, 200 million hectares of agricultural land made a part of production. Um, much of it turned back into forest. That 200 million hectares of agriculture then wasn't created by a lazy That's not a direct question. Well, I'm going to ask a question then because I get to stand up here with a microphone and that's all this perilous. Can you tell us a little bit about who actually read The Economist? Because those were some really fascinating mm -hmm. quotes that you just shared. And I'm curious about who read that on um, paper and uh, some of theirs with the demographics. Who were those? That's a really good question. One that is somewhat difficult to get in the structure. And you find one if I will so, the economist started out in 1943 primarily as an anti quality wild competition and it was supported by the anti corn law league. And the anti corn law league was this huge, uh, this huge mass movement against the uh, sliding scale of uh, tariffs imported grain into the England. Um, and it almost went bankrupt um, when, until the anti porn law made stopped publishing its own paper and recommended to its readers that it would be economist. And that saved the economist. The economist would have been a year, year of education without that. Some of these facts said, oh, wow. Um, and it was financed by one of the richest people. Lord Radley uh, through much of this period as well. It always tried to argue from that period on that it was uh, directed towards the informed upper middle class um, businessman, banker, uh, railway stock uh, uh, promoter. Um, the coupon flippers of the bonds of, of England. Um, but it was also clearly read by many of the lords and uh, nobility of England. Uh, in fact, Lord Clarity, who I mentioned, the Lord in Canada, always wrote, was always writing in James Wilson saying, So, how did your story, you know, how did people respond to your story? Can I do this? Can I do this? Can we make it more draconian? Can we be more repressive? Because he would keep trying uh, out policies through the pages of the economist. Um, the paper wasn't actually called the economist. Um, it had a number of different titles, but it was called um, the, the Economist. Banker, Spisset, Railway Monitor, and Literary Magazine. <laughs> and then it had, it had another addition added to that when it brought in a different thing. So it tried to appeal to a whole bunch of people who were interested in a whole bunch of things. Got really involved in 
the railway in many in the mid uh, 1800s. And so it was read very often because they, they had this detailed accounts of uh, how much money, how much stock they was being purchased on the different railways. It was also um, heavily, heavily involved in cotton and the cotton industry. And so it did a weekly publication in which indicated all of the all of the cotton that was landed in Liverpool, all of the cotton bales that we used, all of the cotton that was needed, all of the cotton that was planted in the US, the price, the expected price of cotton. That. So very clearly we expected and probably rightly that almost all of their cotton industrials from the stores. Got a question there, Jim and Jim sorry, Jim and uh, this, thanks a lot for these talks here. I'm wondering, how does the economist compare uh, and contrast to other major uh, newspapers and magazines targeting sort of the educated elite? So, the Manchester Guardian, the Times Division, Edinburgh Review, and some of these other you know, uh, focus journals that create the names of the Reviews, but um, it's you know these ideas of political economy being dated. So, uh, is the Manchester Guardian very similar, for example, in these early years? Like, I know it wasn't as French as sort of a left and center paper, right? Well, I shared a lot of this. So, how much is the economist sort of even further out in pushing uh, this sort of free market liberalism? Or is it just reflective of much of the print media uh, of the time, and especially these you know, the big sort of newspapers and records? Uh, so it's a really good question. Um, and for those of us who know the Manchester Guardian primarily is a progressive thing, but it's history is not interesting. Uh, James Wilson mentioned both the Manchester so it, uh, it shared a similar kind of approach in some ways. Um, the Manchester Guardian never took it as its mandate to popularize the pure principles of That's it. On the front page, the very first edition of the, um, of the paper, the that's what it's the Times is really interesting. The Times had this duty all the time with the opponents. And it was feuding all the time with the opponents for a number of reasons. But the most interesting one is that um, Lord Rabbit, who was the, uh, the, the funder of the economist, and the Times had a long standing feud running back to the years. And this feud goes back to when Lord Rabbit. Um, prevented poor people in the Arnold's estate from gleaning the leftover grain out the harvest because he wanted to save it for his prize case. And um, this, be, and the Times is all over this, right? So the Times had all sorts of stories about how Radner was saving the land, you know, the, the grain for his pigs and not the poor neighbors. Uh, People wrote in some uh, with uh, the new Ten Commandments, uh, you know, thou shalt save thy uh, burning for thy pigs or something. Uh, there was a play and poem about Lord Bradbury and his pigs. And the Times published all of this with great glee. Uh, and so there was this constant uh, tension between the Times and you know, the economist. At one time, uh, in 1844, maybe 1845, or 1845, the Times, the Times always, the Times was much more popular than the than the Economist, popular in terms of the number of people's um, editions, but also popular in terms of its approach to politics and economics and other kinds of things. And one time, the Times was defending a poor um, seamstress who had sold the clothes that she had been given to the man to feed the children. 
and uh, there was a big debate then in the newspapers and the liberal and the economist the whole world's going to come to an end if we let this happen. And the Times was said, you know, and they got the autonomous and they were harsh and they were really And they have a great story, which they said, the Times says, which they said, um, admit it. You have had your chance. You tried the literature economy. It doesn't work. It needs a emptier field for this. Try it in Siberia. Um, so there's constant criticism between the and the economists. Um, so it, the Edinburgh Review is very different. It's primarily does reviews, publications, and I don't know. So it's very political quality, but not much of it's popular. Um, uh, so I don't think there was anything else really that took the shape of the economist. To see what it was. The economist really was, did do what James Wilson said. He wanted it to do. We want to make the world over in the covers of the economy. We want to make everybody believe that the science of the economy is a real science. And everything they wrote followed that. Often meant that they contradicted themselves, but what clear if it really doesn't. I can go on forever. But <laughs> yeah, and I, as a magazine news uh, historian myself, I, I feel it's perilous to keep going down that road. Yeah. Um, do we have any online questions? Nothing yet. Um, okay. It looks like we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Okay, one or two more questions. I have one. Oh, oh there we go. I'm, I'm just curious about, you know, dreams of the future and looking at capacity production. Do you see any type of resurgence in this production in terms of, you know, small scale agriculture that's kind of blooming around cities, and, you know, CSAs and, and this sort of thing? Do you see any parallels in that type of renewed small scale? production. Um, well, there are people online and people in the audience who can probably uh, respond to that more knowledgeably than I can. Um, but I do see all sorts of parts. I think that part of, part of the intent of writing this book was to suggest how um, remarkably productive um, that kind of intercropped um, the farming can be. And it was remarkably productive in a whole bunch of different locations with a whole bunch of different kinds of restraint constraints. Um, almost all of the ones, places I talked about here, the peasants were constrained in all sorts of ways, forced onto not very good land or needing to work 16 hour days on the sugar plantation and then go to work on their own, uh, on their own crops or all sorts of other constraints. And in each case, they have shown the wonderful resilience of small scale intercrop agriculture. And so I, the book starts out with a snippet from was the advertisement that was sent to me up in Stone Street. I uh, write at the end of the very worst of the um, heat wave in last summer. Last summer? I guess in the anyway. and, uh, and it was an advertisement for uh, land that the largest landowner in Saskatchewan wants to rent out. Largest landowner in Saskatchewan is a guy named Barbara Angela, who is out now about 240,000 acres of land in Saskatchewan. Um, and he rents it out and tries to rent it out. And this advertisement was an advertisement for a parcel near Yorkton for 22,000 acres of land. And, um, and the ad, which was a video of that, we're talking about, uh, talked about how they had um, improved the plan. So they've gotten rid of the dugouts and uh, wind 
barriers and, and wetlands and the hills and all of these things. So now that it could be farmed from corner to corner. And so I tried to compare that and contrast that with these descriptions of the amount of productivity as the average for Angelus. And the suit for this, but Angelus description. And Angela's ad was the description of an environment in this woman's trust. These discussions of peasant agriculture are examples of using what are the scarce resources land, water, fertile soil, immensely productive. And doing it primarily because we use the most abundant resource well, which is land. And so, yeah, I think there's all sorts of lessons um, there. Exactly what those lessons are for, you know, you're an hour out of Kinder's Lane and playing with Roe Reed, I don't know. But, um, but there are lessons. So, historians are horribly bad at pointing out where to go in the future. We're really, really good at saying, look at the past and actually tell you where to go in the future. But then we never go this to do that. Productive. Any other questions? I know Alex has her hand up just in case there was someone who didn't have a chance to ask a question. Right, Alex, you've got the last one. So, this is uh, to Dr. Henry as well as uh, your research assessments. Uh, was there anything in the research that there was surprised you? That really what? That surprised you. Uh, well, Carla and Patrick might have a response to that. Um, uh, two things. The, I've been writing about peasants so off and on for about 40 years. And, um, and I was still um, super surprised and awed by um, how. Um, productive these small intercrop plots of land all over the world. That's a kind of piece of it. Over here, Mayan agriculture in Guatemala knew something about how good that was. Um, I try to do intercrop polycropping in my backyard, and I know my family would start. Um, um, but uh, I, I was just amazed at reading these time after time after time, and place after place after place, as I say, very often by people who didn't want to be impressed, who didn't like them. So that was one surprise for me. Um, the other surprise was just how fun it was to write about the past. Because they write the book. They write the They write the um, they are just so awful, um, but they write so well. Um, exactly as they are so awful when they're racing. Anyway. So you'll know what to do when you get one of those little cards in the mail to subscribe to The Economist. You'll remember this evening, right? <laughs> Thanks, I'm, I'm still hope, waiting for The Economist to review the book. Uh, yeah. well did did you guys have anything you wanted to respond? I was, I would just say that uh, after I read your book this summer, then I reflected back to my research. And I don't think I fully grasped uh, how, yeah, how much violence and unrest there was in the countryside. While the economists continually argued that, you know, capitalism uh, happened naturally and was inevitable. And meanwhile, like things are burning and people are fighting and it's just happening and you just have to get out of the way. So. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jim. This has been a great evening, really passionate presentation. I know we're all uh, enthused about your work. You've been a great audience and um, there's a of books over there. So without further ado, thank you. Thank you. I'll just say a quick thank you and I'll let you get to mingling. Uh, thank you again to Jim Valerie, the University of Saskatchewan Department of History, University of Toronto Press and Fernwood Publishing. Jim will stick around to sign books at the table there. And of course, we've got copies of both for sale at the table right there. Uh, for our virtual guests, copies are available to purchase online at mcnallyrobinson.com. 
You are welcome to get your copies signed before you purchase them. Just make sure to stop at the till on your way out the door. Thank you all so much for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Alyssa.